Hello and welcome to a very special How I Paint Things. Now today we're going to tackle something a little unusual. The fellas over at Great Escape Games got in touch and asked if I would like to have a play around with their upcoming set of Gunfighters, simply titled Gunfighters 2. And the difference there between most of those other Gunfighter sets you're going to find out there is that these are all female sculpts. So yeah, of course I'm going to jump on that. That sounds really interesting. So they sent those along and thank you very much to supplying those. So I got to have a bit of a play around and really do some research to sink my teeth into a, a period that I'm not hugely familiar with women's fashion of the time. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So first of all, we're going to take a quick look at the kit and then we'll get into the painting. All of the paints will be listed in the description below. Let's get started. So let's get a quick look at the sprue. Same as with the first box gunfighters, you've got two sprues the same in the box. There's five miniatures that you can make from each, so ten in a box. Now as with some of the minor details in the other kit, uh, there are one or two little flavor things here that I really like. The little patch of cactus is a nice base detail, and the chicken, I think, is the star of the show. As much as the rest of the kit is really nice, I love this chicken. You know, it's gonna be, it's gonna, I, I really want to paint one of those too. One thing to be aware of though, when you're putting these together, is that unlike the previous kit, where you had uh, sleeved arms, there was one set of arms that had the sleeves rolled up. There are one or two different arms in this kit, which are designed to match specific other ones. They aren't completely interchangeable. So here, for example, you'll see there's puffy sleeves with a pistol, puffy sleeves open hand, and that is true for a handful of them, no pun intended. You're going to find that the slight difference in the cuffs and the sleeves is going to mean that there isn't quite as much customization in the kit as with the other gunfighter box, but I think it's a small trade. Uh, just something to be aware of before you start assembling them. Make sure that your arms are going to match. Now there are quite a few arm options, so you can make a couple of these unarmed. So that's nice. The little lantern over here as a detail, you know, there's lots of neat little bits here which are going to make these useful for more than just gunfighters. Now you'll see straight away that there are four sets of legs which are in skirts or dresses, and just the one in trousers. And at first I wasn't too sure what to make of this. Um, honestly, I would still like one extra pair of trousers, just so that you get a little bit more variety in the posing, but even as you know, more women were picking up weapons and becoming outlaws and such like that, uh, you still found them wearing skirts and dresses because that was what was expected. And even if you're an outlaw, you don't necessarily want to call attention to yourself by bearing being that one weird woman who struts around in men's pantaloons. So the dresses are accurate. That's kind of cool. And I just think one second pair of trousers would have made a big difference. The kit otherwise goes together really easily. But one final note on that, you'll see that there are a handful of heads which have hair, uh, braids or long hair coming to the front of the face. These ones, when you're planning out your, your sculpts, your poses, have a think about how they're going to be posed and dry fit before you start applying anything with glue. Because I did find that the braids got in the way of a couple of the poses that I had in mind. So dry fit is going to be your friend for this kit. All in all though, it's really nice. The detail is crisp, it's going to paint up well. So let's get on to that. So the same as with the fellas, once I've assembled her, I've gone and hit this figure with a spray of Zandri dust from Citadel. Now any medium brown or even a gray will work for this. Reason why I'm using this brownish tint is that if I miss anywhere, once we've shaded it, it's not going to stand out too prominently. Now I'm going to start by painting her skin because obviously we're going to make a real pig's ear of this trying to paint her face in. I have Cadian flesh tone. And let's go ahead, I'm just going to blotch in bleh, <laughs> right over her face there. Uh, you will find it's going to need a couple of coats, but uh, just because we can afford to be a little bit messy here, let's start with the skin. Now with the skin done, what we're going to move on to is her waistcoat. We want to start by painting the lowest levels, where we're most likely to make a mistake, and slowly work our way up, tidying as we go. So I have here Morgast Bone, and I've chosen this because this is a fairly neutral color. It's a kind of beige, just off yellow sort of color. 
and it's going to work quite well to give us a little bit of visual interest in the front of the miniature without overpowering it with another color. So same as most things, this is going to require two coats, but you'll see it does go on quite nicely. Now it's not going to look like much against the Zandri dust that we've put down, but that's going to be fine later. Just a couple of coats, jobs are good. Now we're going to move on to her skirt, and I want to I spent most of my day yesterday doing the research on this, so I, I bear with me because I have to share this with somebody. Now, our Wild West games were normally looking at taking place between sort of 1870 through to the turn of the century. And in this period, patterned material was starting to become quite widely available. You would see a lot of it moving out west, and it wasn't just women with a lot of money who were making their gear and their clothing out of patterned materials, whether it be checks, gingham, floral patterns, stuff like that. Uh, I did read a wonderful letter from a woman, she was a homesteader, and she was writing to her aunt, and in there she quite proudly pointed out that she had made a tablecloth, a set of curtains for her front room, and two shirts for her husband out of the same material. So if you are braver than I am, and you want to paint some patterns, you can go nuts. Uh, there is not a correct answer to this. Anything goes as far as patterning around this period because machine looming and stuff like that is starting to become more common. Industrial scale dyes that are a little more color fast. It's a really interesting period in essentially fashion history. But also common is women still making their own clothing, ordering either huge amounts of linen or canvas and dyeing it themselves. Natural dyes are still in prevalence around America at this stage, particularly out on the homesteads. So greens, browns, uh, reds, anything which is easily dyed is going to be quite common. So if you want to do somebody who's maybe not got a lot of money or is a homesteader, you know, you've got a couple of shotgun wielding women out there standing on the front porch, <laughs> that's, that's going to be a good look, depending on how you want to paint them. So my outlaw here, uh, she's probably a little hard on her luck. She's got enough for a gun belt and a pistol, but I'm going to stick to a single solid color rather than a pattern. So that single color, I'm going to apply Death Guard Green, which is actually quite a pleasant, natural, earthy tone for a green dress. You'll see it goes on fairly well. I've probably watered that down a little more than I should do, but we're going to need to apply two coats anyhow. So... Away we go, and if you did bear with me, <laughs> thank you for that. I just found it really interesting. The, the history of fashion and clothing, it is tied inexorably into the story of how people get around and what was happening in the lives of people around these periods. So looking at clothing and food, particularly, I always find super interesting. I think you'll see, despite being named for one of the grossest of the factions in 40k, Death Guard Green is actually quite a nice color. I'm going to move on now to her jacket. Now, this has got quite short and uh, very straight sleeves, but it is cinched at the waist, so it's clearly been either made by her or tailored for her. So I'm going to go, I want a sort of kid leather kind of color here. I have XV88. I'll start on her back and apply a little of this. Now for the leather of her boots, I'm going to use Mournfang Brown. Uh, this is a nice one, nice rich color, and goes on fairly well. At the same time, what I'm going to do is go around and just splatter the hat band with some of this, because it's not going to matter too much if I hit the rest of the hat, versus if I paint the hat color in first and then try and paint the hat band, I've got to be way more careful, and uh, nah, I don't like being careful, you know me by now. Now, speaking of her hat, it's going to be way easier if we paint in her hair and her mask now versus, again, trying to paint around the hat. So I have Mephiston Red, and I'm going to paint in her mask because at this stage, I really want to add something which is going to brighten her up a bit. We've stuck to quite earthy tones so far, so something a bit flash that's going to catch the eye is what I want here. For her hair, I'm going to use Black Grey from Vallejo. If you want to stick to Citadel, then something like Eschen Grey or Corvus Black will work perfectly well here. Uh, but as always, I tend to find the coverage on some of these really dark Vallejo colors just a little better. 
Now finally we're going to paint in her hat. I have Rakarth Flesh for this. Now, this one, it goes on quite light, but I think you'll tend to find it does darken down a little as it dries. So take your time when you come up near the hat band. Just slow down a little. And it's much easier to paint near to that than it is to have to try and paint a straight line later on. We're starting to hit the home stretch for base coats. I have here Saddle Brown. This is a Vallejo color. And it is one of my favorite choices when it comes to warm red leather. It's a little bit darker than Mahogany Brown, which is one you'll hear me use quite often too. Uh, I'm going to paint in all of her belt straight over the top of the bullets she's got there. Just save a little time and we'll paint over those later. You'll see the coverage on this is excellent. For a pistol and the little bits of belt buckle that you can see, I'm going to use Lead Belcher. This is relatively bright compared to what I would sometimes use for these old six shooters. But we are going to highlight it anyhow. And I'm going to swap on down to a smaller brush <laughs> to do that belt buckle. Finally, for her base coats, I'm going to use a little bit of Retributor Armor, which is a wonderful gold, brassy, bronze sort of color, and just dot in these bullets. And once you've done all of your base coats, you can cruise around and do any tidy up that you need to do. As ever, saving your tidy up to your final stage will save a bit of time overall. What I have lurking in the background here, this is, it's called, or I've always called it, Marine Juice. Uh, it sounds a little sinister, but it is from the Forge World Army Painting Team and how they get through huge swathes of Space Marines. Now it is a mix. This is equal parts non-oil, Reichland Flesh Shade, and Lamian Medium. And what this gives us is a faint reddish tint, uh, a little less powerful than Agrax Earthshade. Now you could use Agrax here if you wanted to, uh, I would suggest you're still going to want to thin it with a little bit of medium, but one way or the other, we're just going to bucket this quite generously over the whole miniature. Anywhere that it collects in big pools, shift it around a little, but don't worry if you do get some tide marks on this. It'll look a little more natural. Once we've gone over all of this, we're going to let her dry for about half an hour. And when at last your shade has dried, you're going to have something that looks like this. And as always, we don't need to reinvent the wheel if we just want to put some models on the table. That's not looking too bad. I'm going to do a little bit of highlighting though, because why not? I tend to think it does bring out those details a little more. So what I have is some Baylor Brown. Now this is one, genuinely I don't use it very often, but I'm always glad to have it. If you wanted to do this without needing to buy a fresh pot, what you could do would be to grab a little bit of uh, Wraithbone or Ivory or similar and just mix it into your XV88. But really that is up to you whether or not you want to spend the time mixing or just get an extra pot. Now for a waistcoat, I'm going to use a little bit of Flayed One Flesh. Now for her skirt, I'm going to use a little Nurgling Green. But I want to show you something really easy for getting a straight line on some of these details. So for example here, these creases on her skirt, they all meet at her knee. So rather than painting away from the knee, what I'm going to do is flip her upside down. And I generally find it easier to paint up and draw the paint towards one point like that. Now when it comes to highlighting red, this is one of the few cases where I think adding a little ivory or off-white or similar doesn't always work. You'll end up with something which is a little bit more pink than you might like. So highlighting red, I tend to find you best off pick up another red color. For this I have wild wider wild wider wild <laughs> for this I have wild rider red, and we're gonna go ahead, just put a little of this. Oh goodness. Should have had less on my brush. Whoopsie doodle. Oh well, that'll look good on the table. Now when it comes to her hands, I'm going to go ahead and use Kids Left Flesh to highlight these. Now I'm not going to bother trying to highlight the little scrap of face that we can see under her helmet though. Helmet, goodness me, her hat. You see it practically disappears there. So instead I'm going to concentrate on fingers. Now after that we're going to use a little bit of Flayed One Flesh just to get the tips of her fingers and some of her knuckles. Now, if you are worried that that's a little too pale, what you can do is get some Reichland Flesh Shade and a little bit of Lamian Medium. 
I've mixed them on my palette about half and half, and all I'm going to do is a quick glaze over the top of the skin, just to reintroduce a little bit of warmth there, without making it significantly darker. Now there isn't really a single colour which quite matches what I have in mind for this Rakarth Flesh highlight, so I've got Rakarth Flesh and just a tiny wee dot of white mixed into it. What I'm going to do is, using the edge of my brush, scoop around the edge of her hat, and do the same at the top towards the front here too. And now for the red leather details, what I've got is, well, this is a Vallejo paint called Red Leather. This one is a really nice, rich, just off orange kind of colour actually. And I would suggest when you're using this to try and be a little sparing with it, because if you do apply too much of this, what you're going to find is your leather starts looking more like skin, and you don't necessarily want that. Now one of the last highlights that I'm going to do is for her hair. I have just a tiny wee bit of Mechanicus Standard Grey. And same as with the leather, you don't want to apply too much of this. Just concentrate towards the edges and any really high points of her hair. Now once I'm done with this, um, honestly, you could highlight her boots or her gun or what have you, but I'm really just interested in finishing her off. So I'm going to go ahead, varnish her, pop a base on, and we'll get a look at what she looks like which is all complete. And there we have it. At last, our outlaw is complete. And I really enjoyed doing this. Uh, it was well worth the research. I found it fascinating to look into the how and the why of clothing of the period. And while ultimately I did decide on something quite simple by comparison, it was a lot of fun to put the research in and come up with something that would be easy enough to put on the table without a lot of fuss. Now the kits are cool. Even if there wasn't a real 50-50 you know, gender split when you look at outlaws and gunslingers of the Old West period, the option being there to put them on the table and to have a nice plastic box, it is really nice. So well done to Great Escape Games for making that happen, and thank you again to them for sending this set along for me to have a play around with. As always, as well, thank you very much to Exit 23 Games for the light and sound equipment, as well as all of the patrons who keep me ticking in paints and glue, including my wonderful producers, Alan Nuttall, Kyrie Crawford, Trainboy, Fred, and Jimmy. Your support lets me pick up paints to do stuff like this. Any questions or anything, feel free to drop them in the old comments box below. My Twitter and Instagram are both linked there too. So thank you very much for your time, one and all, and you all enjoy the rest of your day.